Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archive classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kastil Badas. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Sleep in Saturday. It's Q&A Saturday. And we've been sleeping in this whole week because I'm in my COVID recovery, taking it slow, taking it easy. Uh, how are you, Kostuba? I'm doing okay, Rogan. If you're new to the show, welcome. Today is the day. We go live on Facebook as well. It like triples our audience and we um, answer common questions on your spiritual path. That's part of it. <clears throat> no one's accepting or no one wants blind followers on the Vedic path, on the yogic journey. Blind acceptance gives you nothing. It just makes you uh, walk into walls. <clears throat> and we need discernment, discrimination um, as we move forward on our path. The Bhagavatam itself, the main uh, Vedic study of Bhakti Yoga um, for India for thousands of years, it pushes us, goads us, encourages us. You have to sharpen intelligence. And on that path, you need to ask these questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Does this make sense? How does this apply to my life? Is this relevant to me uh, in the modern world? This book was written thousands of years ago. These are all important questions. And every week you can add, uh, write in your questions to wisdom of the sages 108 at gmail.com. Kostuba and myself, we try to answer these questions as best as we can, or we defer to someone exponentially more enlightened than us. <laughs> We're enlightened. We're uh, we're works in progress. How are you, Kostub? I'm doing okay. Um, you know, I I didn't even mention this to you before, but I just thought I'd mention it now. Is uh, just yesterday or the day before, uh, there was a horrible incident in Bangladesh. Did you hear about that? Horrible what? Incident that the 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 Krishna Temple, the the Iskon Temple in Bangladesh, Bangladesh, was by like a mob of over two hundred people. And they just burned it down and, and injured and even killed some of the devotees there. That was that was in Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah. I heard that. That was horrible. It's horrible. And so, uh, you know, our prayers for for those people, and you know, hopefully, um, they can restore that place. And our prayers for the lives of the devotees and their loved ones. And uh, hopefully, you know, it's it's a very hard world over. You know, the religious fanaticism is at such an extreme. You can see it plays out in such horrible ways. And so just, again, our prayers for those devotees. Yeah, prayers going out. It's just, ugh. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it really minimizes uh, um, some, like, puny thing I might be going through or we might be going through when you hear about stuff like that. Yep. Okay. And that's in Bangladesh. Bangladesh was, you know, it was pre-partition part of India, East Bengal. There's a lot of devotees there, actually. Well, it was actually where, where our Sampradaya, our lineage is really originates and, you know, in what is now West Bengal and Bangladesh, which are used to be part of India. Yeah, that was so many East of our, Bengal. So many of our saints and, you know, um, important figures, you know, in, in the past come from that area. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, we have Q&A day. Anything we want to yeah. say before Q&A day starts? Marjorie? 
Uh, yeah, we have a Bhakti recovery group meeting today at 930. And then mm -hmm. also Tina Scheid from Germany is offering um, some breathwork workshops. She's going to do a three part series over the next couple months. And part one is today at 11 a.m. Eastern time right. for Patreon members. Yeah. So that's for Patreon members. There's a community supported podcast. You want to join our little Patreon party? You can. You got to go to patreon.com slash wisdom sages. And if you like what we do, that's the easiest way just to support us. You make some monthly contribution, and then we have a whole little secretive Patreon community you can join in on where we have classes, workshops, and things like that. And Kostuba and myself give some classes on there too. And they're all recorded, so you can go back and listen to them all. Um, and also we do, I just want to mention this because, you know, you could just forget about it, but or if you're new to it, you could just breeze over it. We have a whole parallel uh, Bhakti recovery group, which is quite amazing. It uses the principles of the 12-step program, but sort of replaces the, quote, higher power with sweet baby Krishna. <laughs> so, so instead of sort of like in a 12-step group where you just have the idea of a higher source, in the Bhakti tradition, we say, well, God also is a power, but that power has form and personality. Quite very easy to fall in love with sweet baby Krishna. And so the Bhakti Recovery Group goes on our Patreon members. And any way to, uh, what's the best way they can reach that, Kastuba, to get connected with it? If people have either recovery uh, issues or um, recovery desires, they can write to Bhakti Recovery at gmail.com. And um, they will get their, all the info they need there. Okay, let's. All right. You can also go to our website and you can find that info is there as well. Wisdom yep. of the Sages. Wisdom of the com. Sages com. Yeah. Ready to go? Ready, sir. I got a question for you coming from Jake. This was written in via email. And he writes, this is for Raghunath. You ready? Yeah. How does martial arts nestle with Bhakti Yogi's path, with the Bhakti Yogi's path? I understand that you, Raghuji, are a practitioner of jujitsu, or at least were at one point. What merit does the path of the martial artist hold for the devotee? For me... It centers around aspects such as preservation of life, protection of the innocent, self-discipline, the learning process, focus, and emotional control. What is your take? Going deeper, if it is something you can comment on, how can the professional war fighter see his function? Obviously, war is a terrible horror. To the men and women employed to defend life through war, what perspective? Perspectives might aid them in walking this path with devotion and good dharma. I pair these questions as I intuit that they are close kin. Thank you for your continued service in so many ways. Thank you, Raghunath. Good question, Jake. And I'm going to zoom way the hell out right now to get to the bottom of this. Okay. Um, because mm -hmm. I don't think it's just necessarily martial arts. I'm like I'm a martial arts fan. Um, but it's actually everything we do not isolate our spiritual life from our life, um, period. Um, uh, and so with, with real like sort of like these Vedic lenses, how we're seeing the world, I'm going to zip on over to my good buddy here, Bunky. You know, <laughs> we were talking about this the other day. You know, Bunky is a, what's the official word? Drag artist. Drag artist. He's a drag artist. So we're going we're gonna to tie this drag artistry into uh, martial arts as well. And we can st we can even throw in Mara here, our famous chef. She's a famous chef in this these parts. Um, but say within uh, the drag community, which I know nothing about, although I did work in a drag. I did work at the Pyramid Club for a few years. But um, <laughs> okay, gives you some, some background. <laughs> but whether you're doing mixed martial arts or um, some type of uh, some type of martial arts, you're part of the drag community, or you're a chef, or you're just running a business, you can do it. In, within, the, within the spectrum of these three gunas. Isn't that true? You can have a tamasic drag queen life. And you might have been there, Bunky, right? <laughs> right? You can go into a culture where there's lots of intoxicants, where there's lots of promiscuity, where there's lots of just reckless behavior, where there's even violence or heavy drugs, where you could end up in prison at the end of the night. You could do it. <clears throat> at the same time, uh, we were having this conversation the other day, you know, um, as far as dressing up 
in different clothing. You know, Indra Jumna Swami does this incredible presentation through the, uh, you know, the uh, Eastern Europe, the Baltic Sea, where they make these incredible costumes and puppetry and uh, dressing up. And uh, it, it's like transcendental drama, but it's like very cool and cutting edge. And I was thinking probably fulfills similar feelings of dressing up but it's all directed towards people's edification you're in a community where people really want to um upgrade the quality of their life and you're putting on performances that is lifting people higher um so the same thing is happening the dressing up is happening um, but one is bringing our consciousness higher. One is with the community of people who have high consciousness. And one is perhaps, you know, crippling, degrading, uh, problematic, uh, low brow, low vibe, et cetera. Now, those are two extremes and there's a lot in between. Now, you can do the same thing with, say, being a chef. You know, you could work as a short order cook flipping burgers. You could work as, you know, with Mara's evolution program cooking high vibe, you know, living foods, you know, she's always bringing me over medicinal juices and things like that. And according to her consciousness, she's going to set the bar of what she's creating. And of course, it's going to attract. A matter of fact, if you're attracted to flipping burgers, you're not going to be attracted to working in her kitchen. It's just it's just not a welcoming environment for burger flippers. Um, so the, the, the leaders of the of that activity are setting standards, setting parameters, etc. And that's going to affect everybody in her universe in the same way. Justin also, if he's thinking about which he is thinking about getting back into, you know, entertainment because he's a naturally entertainer, dancer, dresser upper. Uh, he, he's going to have to decide, like, OK, how is that going to fit in? What part of that culture am I going to fit or am I going to have to recreate the, my own culture? And therefore, you take that same exact thing to warfare. Now, warfare doesn't have to be noble. And both you and I, Kostuba, have hung out with very ignoble people using warfare to pick on people, bully people, hurt people, you know, thugs, basically. They use their skill to be cruel, to be harmful, to be hurtful, um, to, to, to extort money from people. Um, at the same time, to the degree that you add dharma and to the degree that you add a type of like refinement to the skills of warfare, that same thing, which, you know, warfare is passionate. You're, you're, you know, uh, you're going out with aggression to the same degree. You add that um, self-control and discipline to it. What's happening is become that very passionate art now becomes refined. It is passionate in one sense. You're you're fighting. But you know what's also happening? You are um, doing it with incredible discipline. And if you watch great martial artists fight, there you can, a real great martial artist, they are like you know, it, it, it's like doing fine art painting. It's like doing ballet. It's it's not a, a couple thugs, even though it may appear from that. Everything is perfectly planned, and and not only that, the minds are controlled. Meaning, after you get hit, after you get punished. You'll go to the opponent and say, that was quite incredible what you just did. That I, I'm quite impressed. And people were fighting without that rage. And that's where this whole idea of uh, fighting out of duty, out of dharma. You're not fighting with rage any longer. You're not fighting with um, hatred any longer. You're actually fighting out of duty. And if you bring it back to fighting, if we go full circle to his question, there is a, um, a class of people who need to cook. There's a pat class of people who need to dress like women and dance. And we're with one of them right now. And there is a class of people who need to entertain and make, a, make us laugh. And there's a class of people who need to defend vulnerables. And there's vulnerables in every society. And that's where you have, any civilization will have a type of, uh, uh, some type of warrior class of people. This is part of having a, ha part of having a society. And, and therefore, they have to be learned. Now, of course, once they play the gunpowder game, that, that changes things up a little bit. You know, of course, um, I think like martial arts skills are great. They're ancient, but they're old and ancient. You know, once you've leveled the playing field, once they've played the gunpowder game and start building bombs or chemical warfare, etc. 
<clears throat> but these are all still military protection um, arts. The problem is, of course, when you start outsourcing your power, that becomes a problem because then all of a sudden we, we fall into this thing where like, well, who is now directing my strength and my warfare? That's a, that's a, that's a little bit of a problem. Um, so uh, that's something that needs to be like thoroughly teased out, ripped apart, um, discussed. But the, I think the point is, is the point is there that, you know, we're adding Dharma to our life and we're refining as in the cook, as the entertainer, as the warrior, uh, we're refining where do we put the pressure on um, in, our, in our chosen fields? And how do we do that with Dharma so that not just we benefit, and I'm, I'm not just saving my own butt here, but I'm actually affecting the whole community that I'm, that I'm uh, ass assisting with my skill, right? What do you think about that, Kasim? Well, I think it sounded like Jake kind of had the had a lot of it covered himself. You know, he kind of covered all these things. But I think you you went deeper into it. So thank you. Did I ask or answer both of his questions? And I think you did. It, it is a little bit nuanced when you're dealing with um, when you're dealing with like shifting times and politics. Um, we like to think like this political movement is right. This political movement is wrong. But it's very similar to a divorce. It's hard to understand the biggest picture of politics. Um, but there is like internal ethics, I think, that we have to internalize. I think the Mahabharat is, is great. And I think studying Dharma, these are like important things for war children of warriors. You know, you grow up, the, you know, you read about growing up in these princely families where the children study ethics uh, and they, they study, you know, laws and how to act out of courage and not be, um, you need that class of people that are just going to act appropriately and they're not going to be swayed by fear. Um, so the, there is a, a calling for that. Some people will have that calling naturally. Some people just like the idea of martial arts, but it's not necessarily calling to be a warrior. That's okay also. All right. Uh -huh. Is that okay, Mara? I think Mara should be a drag queen. <laughs> and you should be the cook, Bunky. <laughs> Why do you switch roles for a week? Actually, I just had uh, the local gym ask me to teach boxing there. The local gym asked Mara to teach. I told you, I've, I've mentioned before, Mara has, you know, like <laughs> hidden powers. It's like she, she, she appears like a normal woman, but when she starts lifting stuff, she's really strong. Yeah, she hit me in the jaw the other day. <laughs> like upper, uppercut right to my jaw okay here's one for you oh right. look who it's from our daily zoomer chapu g from okay. venezuela chapu chapu's not a real name i don't know she has chapu there but it's i think it's anna maria right i think but, it's gabby i thought it was gabby. okay well, Ga no anna gabrielle i think that's what it is yeah but maybe we go with chapu here it's her nickname yeah what are you guys talking about <laughs> Heard Chapu asked this question or not? Yeah, it's Chapu, Chapu same person. Yeah. Okay. It's for you, Kastuba. Ready? All right. For the yeah. past few months, I've been humbly leading Bhagavad Gita and Japa sessions. So Japa Excellent. is chanting on your, you know, Indian rosaries, mm -hmm. um, and leading Bhagavad Gita sessions on Mondays via Zoom. As in every group, some students left. Some others were ready to open their hearts to sweet baby Krishna. And others stayed just to hear more and give this beautiful path a chance. Now, while discussing the features of the supreme energy, Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan, the statement came up that being aware only of the impersonal Brahman or Paramatma is not a bad thing, but it's not complete awareness. However, by inquiring sincerely as these meetings, uh, as in these meetings, we can get into that personal perception of Bhagavan Krishna and maybe have a direct look into God's merciful eyes one day. You can just tell Chapu's a devotee just for the way she writes. Yeah. A dear student felt discouraged because she told us that because of her previous broken Catholic background, she didn't feel comfortable seeing God 
as a being, as a person. Rather, she feels the energy at the beach, the mountains, within her loved ones and her pets, and in other, and in other impersonal ways, but definitely not as a being or a person whose lotus feet are the ultimate refuge. Although I explain that this is a gradual process as the examples of the mountain that leads to no failure in any way, and that just by her disposition to come over and over to hear about Krishna and Arjuna's chanting with a sincere intention is building uh, that stare into the Bhagavan perception, I know she needs a little bit more. I want her to feel that there is always going to be a place for her and everyone in this path. And that's why I come to you, because I know for sure you, you'll have the best tools she'll use to approach that personal aspect of God. Thank you again and again, Raghu and Mara. Also, uh, do for us, uh, do for the us, and especially, oh, thank you for all that you do for us, especially for this fallen soul named Gabby Chapuji. Hey, oh, Gabby. I get it. Same Chapu Gabby. is her last name. No, no, I don't think Chapu is her last name. I think it's, like no. a, it's a nickname or something. So you've got to clarify that for us. Okay, so thank you for the question. And you know, almost like the last question, it seems like you got a really good handle on it, you know, already. But let's just, let's examine it a little bit. Um, from a purely rational point of view, right, we could break this down. And, and you wrote that uh, a dear student felt, and that word import is important, right, that they felt discouraged because she told us that because of her previous broken Catholic background, she didn't, and again, feel comfortable seeing God as a person. And so this is, you know, her, the way that she's approaching the idea that it, it, whether God has personality or not is being defined here as an emotional response rather than like a rational approach, right? There's reasoning. If, if someone's going to have that faith in God as a person, it's going to have to pass through two gates, is going to have to pass through the gate of their uh, rationale. Does this make sense? And it's going to have to pass through the, their emotional gate as well. Do I feel good about this? And so um, it seems like the um, emotional gate is what's preventing her from fully embracing that personal idea of God. And um, you're saying, I know she needs a little more. I, and, and, and I liked what you said. You said, I want her to feel. Again, that word feel. I want her to feel that there's always a good, going to be a place for her and everyone on this path. And I think that's a wise approach. You know, you, she's, she's coming from an emotional platform. You can't necessarily, um, you, you can't, by, by approaching her on the rational basis, straight off, is not necessarily going to affect her emotional, where she is emotionally. So in other words, you could provide all kinds of rational arguments to her. She, if she had a rational argument against it, it might sound something like this. I think form by definition is limited and that God is unlimited. Therefore, God must not have form. That would be like a rational argument. Then you could, you could respond with rational arguments to that. But this is an emotional approach. And rational arguments are, are probably not going to do much to help. And, if, and as a matter of fact, if you start laying on the rational arguments, it's likely that the emotional response will be to turn off to it, right? Like someone's trying to force this on me, cram it, cram it down my throat. So I, I think what you, what you said is good, that you want her to feel that there's always going to be a place for her and everyone on this path. And so I think that if she appreciates you and other people that practice this, and she sees that you're happy on your path, that it's given you happiness, that it hasn't, it hasn't, well, your personal path of devotion hasn't damaged you like her previous experience did, right? So that you're happy and you're kind to others. And especially you're non-judgmental. You know, okay, if that's where you're at, I accept that. Because that whole thing is coming from a, a sense of guilt and judgment, you know, most likely, you know, her previous experience. So let her feel that. And, and especially let her see, you know, that you're becoming free from the control of your n lower nature. In other words, things like lust and greed and anger, that's probably what she's looking for in a spiritual path, right? That we feel God, we can feel God everywhere, and, and it's lifting us up, and it's making us better people, and it's freeing us from our lower nature. If she feels all this, 
that will, that will open her heart to you as a person. Maybe she's not ready for God as a person, but she'll be ready for you as a person. And then on top of that, when, when, that, when, that, when that faith in, in you as a person is deeper and deeper and deeper, then on top of that, um, your rational approach will begin to sink in. You know, or let's say it can begin to sink in. That she, that 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 once that that um, emotional barrier has been dropped to some degree, then that then she may open herself up to hearing uh, the more rational approach, and be, and you can begin to operate on that level, and, and then she can see. But forcing doesn't work. So you know, really, it requires patience. It seems like that's where you're coming from. And um, I think she's in good hands. So thank you for the service that you're doing, Chapuji. Mm, very sweet. Yeah. All it's, right. It, it's really difficult. Yeah. You have to become expert at how much to give people and how much to sort of back off from people. Yeah. And how much to give and how much to back off. Yeah. <sighs> you, you know, it's like that, like we say, you know, you can have that thing where it's, I, I don't think, I think it's really, um, sad and, and awkward sometimes when people have an approach, you know, whether it's with Krishna Bhakti or other, you know, faiths or spiritual paths, you know, where the idea is, I'm just going to speak the truth and what they can accept it or not. And, you know, it's, um, that always it's, works. Yeah. Well, I mean, in other words, yeah, <laughs> when you, when you're approaching, you know, purely from the, the head and not the heart, when you're, when you're coming entirely from rational and not, understanding the emotional needs of someone or the emotional approach someone has, then, um, you know, you're, you're not really, um, doing the full service in my opinion, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. <clears throat> okay. Right. We got up. a question for you coming from Amalie. Love that name. Amalie. Amalie. Amalie asks, First, thank you again for the work you're doing in this world. Your podcast has been a grounding presence during one of the hardest years of my life, and I'm deeply grateful for this. Well, thank you, Emily. I have a pretty simple question. Two senior devotees, right? Two bhakti yogis, senior to Emily, have done me a favor in the last week. One of them without even knowing me. Very nice, huh? It's nice. I'm truly grateful for their time and gesture. And what would be the best way to show my appreciation to these devotees? I feel words are not enough. In the quote-unquote regular world, I could perhaps send a gift or something similar. But in bhakti, what does one do to show deep appreciation? Welcome for... to the irregular world of bhakti! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for considering my question, sending you love and appreciation. You know what we do in the very peculiar world of bhakti? We do the same exact thing. <laughs> we give gifts. We give little, little, little tokens of friend. Isn't it nice to get a letter? That's not just like a bill. Just a letter. That's a nice thing. Hey, appreciate that. Appreciate Hard. this. Thank you so much. You know, especially if you know the person. I know when I deal with devotees, or sometimes when people deal with me, they ha I have a little altar, so. I love to get little flowers or little fruits that I can offer on my altar mm -hmm. much more than if someone's just even send me something. But I think those personal gestures, people appreciate them. It, 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 we, we live in a world where you just send a person a, a winky emoji. I mean, when do I ever send Mara a thank you letter for all the stuff she does? Right. Yeah. Look at her over there. She's, <laughs> she's, she's hurt and bitter. <laughs> I should be she writing does you so thank you letters. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, you know, the best she gets from me is like a winky emoji, you know, but when people spend some time, they write a little thank you note or bake you something. Damodar Priya brought these muffins over. It was so sweet. You know, Kateri brought some stuff over. It's just like a gesture of your heart and people appreciate it. You don't have to do anything crazy within bhakti circles. It's definitely a little bit more refined. You're not going to bring over a, uh, you know, a leg of lamb or anything, but <laughs> You're gonna you're gonna bring you know you bring over a gesture of fruit of something to drink or uh, write write a note, yeah. It's just sweet loving gestures, and then in the receiving of those things, that's also part of the loving exchange that we have. Um, yeah, this is how we become. This is how we make friends. This is like a very refined way. It sounds simple to have friendship. 
you know, in the old days, there... go for, let's go out for a beer. You know, we don't do that. <laughs> but we do do the similar object of I'm buying you a beer. Or, you know, I'm here. I'm Here's some coconut water. Well, it's there in the Shastra too, right? Tadati, Prati, Grinati. Yeah. We give and we accept. Yeah. Uh, offerings well, these are the, of love. The loving exchanges between bhakti yogis. And then we step yeah, it up yeah. we step it up a notch and we offer yeah. we offer our our minds to somebody. That's what the Bhakti Recovery Group is 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 so successful about too. Because you're in a circle of sacred people and people are sharing, like, hey, this is what I'm going through. Can you hold this space for me? Mm -hmm. And people hear and and people hold and people assist them in their own recovery by sharing their 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 pain. <clears throat> and that's part of friendship as well. It's all there. Just like we're talking about martial arts, a, a refined martial artist, as opposed to being a thug. It's all there. Relationships are there. But we're like just upgrading the quality of it. And therefore, you up upgrade the results of it as well. Hmm. You know, you and me are good buddies. So we go to a bar and we wake up hungover. We have that exchange of friendship, but now we're drunk or hungover and have to sleep until 11 and we both have headaches. So it, it, it's an upgrading of the same exact thing. We don't have to give up anything. Matter of fact, we, we were talking about this yesterday. Our sensual experience is actually better. Isn't that true? Our, our sensual, sensual experience. Oh, it, it improves as a devotee. It improves. Yeah, it does. It improves. You know, but I like the point you make. Like when someone writes, when someone takes the time nowadays, right, to, to write a letter or to get a card and to write a message and actually share their heart and share their appreciation. It means a lot when you receive that. It's like people, people get it. It's like, it's, it's, um, it, it likely carries more weight than just words, which pass by very quickly and may or may not be spoken with the same, um, level of, of, um, I don't know, realism you know like it, when, when someone writes down and they think carefully about what they want to say and, and and share really how much they appreciate something it, it, it touches a person's heart and then it opens up like that relationship to become deeper and so that's a great way to do it right just just really think about why you appreciate what this person's done for you and then write a, a note of appreciation send it over to him there you go all right this is from uh but gifts are good too <laughs> yes Hey, I want to give a shout out to um, anyone who's thinking they want some good company. <clears throat> I want good company, too. And that's why we're planning our Wisdom of the Sages retreat in Cali, Colombia. January, we are getting out of here. We're going to bust away from the cold. Grab someone that you love. We try to keep it. The price is reasonable. The experience exotic, transcendental, incredible food. They have a great community down there. Come join us at Sham Ashram. If you're interested, you got to go to Bhakti Retreats. Is that it? Bhakti Retreats at gmail.com? I believe so. Mary saying Mara. something else. Mary saying, no, don't go. <laughs> yeah, Bhakti Retreats Bakhti 108. 108, yeah. Bhakti Retreats, Retreats 108, 108 at gmail.com. That's January 12th through the 21st. Cindy Lunsford is going to be there. She's signing autographs. Oh, awesome. Some of the famous yoga teachers from down south. And um, <clears throat> we're going to have our whole posse. Mara is going to be there. She's going to be whipping up stuff in the kitchen. She doesn't know that yet. And, of course, me and Kastuba. So we're looking forward to meeting you others, meeting you Zoomers, and hanging out for a quality week. And also, if you want to stay longer, we're offering a discount for the other trainings, which is me and Madhu are doing a Kirtan Academy. If you want to add some Kirtan to your life, to your teachings, that's going to be the week after. So you'd get 200 bucks off that and 200 bucks off the next uh, off that training. So we're trying to make it so people can just hang out for a month. And then, of course, me and Bobby are doing our Yin Restorative Bhakti Retreat January 2nd. So um, you can check all this stuff out on my website, raghunath.yoga. And um, I, I don't know if we're live yet with wisdomofthesages.com yet, but you can email bhaktiretreats108 at gmail.com because that is about to sell out. Um, <clears throat> okay. It's your turn, sir. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. And if I word this inelegantly, Who's I it apologize. Coming from? Who's it coming from? No name. It does have a name. Come from Todd Harris. Oh, from okay. oh it's Todd Harris from yeah. La Laval. That's the way you say it. Laval. Laval. That's how they say it in Kentucky? They say it somewhere. Laval Something like Kentucky. that, but I'm saying it wrong. It's not Louisville. It's like it's like Laval. <laughs> okay. 
I have a question, and if I word this inelegantly, I apologize. Todd Harris, he and his wife got into Bhakti, sort of like, I think through Cindy Lunsford. They just, uh, they were, uh, she did a yoga teacher training. She got inspired. She started telling Todd. Next thing you know, they have a whole Bhakti family going on. Wow. Cindy Lunsford's the guru. Okay, I have a question, and if I word this inelegantly, I apologize in advance. Krishna tells Arjuna that he should become detached from the material world to see stones and gold as the same. Mm. But then he clearly sides with Arjuna against the Kauravas, even though he knows in the eternal scheme of things, the outcome is immaterial. Was this just one of Krishna's leelas, a game he was enjoying, or was he actually choosing sides? Granted, he loves his devotees. But everyone and everything is part of him. So eventually, everyone's a devotee, right? Good question. Please know I'm not questioning Krishna. He's God and can do whatever he wants. I just want to understand him better. That is a great question. Thanks for all that you do. Todd Harris from Lao Bao. It is a nice question. So, Todd, let's get into this. Um, so, the good question. In other words, much of the Bhagavad Gita is telling us about having this equal mind, right? No friends and enemies, seeing gold and stones is the same, you know, um, seeing that soul in every living being and not developing, you know, um, particular likes and dislikes. But, but he, he, so he asks here, he says, granted, Krishna loves his devotees, but everyone and everything is part of him. So eventually everyone is a devotee, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, that's true. But at the same time, he grants us independence. He grants us the freedom to respond to him as we want to. And then he responds accordingly. You know, so, so although it appears that Krishna is, in one sense, he's taking sides. In another sense, he's benedicting everyone according to the way that they approach him. So there's a famous verse in Bhagavad Gita, Samoham Sarva Bhute Shu, Name Dve Shostina Priyaha. Right? He says, Samoham Sarva Bhuteshu, I'm equal to everyone, right? Name uh, Dvesho, Stina Priyaha. No one is particularly, Dvesha means like, no, I, I'm not like against anyone, and I'm not particularly for anyone. Dvesha means like hatred, or, you know, and, and Priya means like dearness. So he says, I don't, it's not like I'm coming to the table with some kind of um, agenda, bi bias, you know, bias. Right, I like these kind of people. I don't like these kind of people. He's like, I'm open to everyone. Some of them sarva Right, um, but he goes on to say that whoever renders service to him in devotion, that that person becomes his friend, and is and he says and is in me, you know, maiti maite teshu chapiham. He says that person is in me, and I'm also in them. Right. I, they become my friend and I become their friend. In other words, I'm equal to everyone, but some people come up and say, Krishna, I want to be your friend. And as soon as they say that, I'm their friend in a special way, in a way that he is beyond those that don't turn to him, right? He's the friend of everyone and he's benedicting everyone. And he's waiting for us to turn back to him and say, um, I want you. I want to connect with you. I want to reconnect with you, right? Now, there's a verse, another Gita verse, where Krishna describes, you know, this is getting more into like the whole Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita kind of thing that he's, that Todd is bringing up here, where Krishna describes why he descends into this world and what he does. And that, that verse, often quoted verse, Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chaduskritam dharmasangstar banarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. So, Paritranaya sadhunam. I come to deliver the sadhus, right? I come to deliver those people that that are. We it was a few weeks back. We did the um, the the qualities of the sadhu, right? Tatikshiva, karunaka, suridam sarvadehi. That that you know, a person that's tolerant and merciful, and and um, you know, turning to God, connecting with God, cultivating that godly nature. He says, "I come to deliver them, and vinashaya chaduskritam, and I come to annihilate the miscreants," right? So, okay, sounds like he's taking sides. Well, no, everyone has that opportunity to be a sadhu. And he's not going to, and there's no material kind of um, disqualification 
that that's it's not open to some and not open to others but according to how you respond to him if you come as a sadhu then he delivers you and if you come as a miscreant then he benedicts you in another way right this is something you know it's it's it doesn't work for everyone but it works for for krishna for vishnu you know in whatever way he's associating with you it's a benediction it's said that everyone that died on that battlefield of Kurukshetra achieved a type at least some type of liberation but of course according to how you approach him it, it's it's it, you know it manifests in different ways but this is the idea though in a sense we've turned our backs to god in a sense we've we've broken up with him just like you break up with your ex and you say you know enough i don't want to hear from you anymore don't text me anymore don't call me anymore i'm on my own now and Krishna's just sitting there waiting, like, okay, but when you're <laughs> when you're ready, you know, I'll I'll um I'm ready to accept you back. And when you when I do expect accept you back, I'm gonna accept you with a special kind of love, you know, that that you're not opening yourself up to for right now. In the in the commentary to that verse, Prabhupada writes, it is not necessary for the Supreme Lord to appear as he is to destroy the miscreants. Right, he he is he says as he did with the demons Ravana and and Kamsa, the Lord has many agents who are quite capable to vanquish the demons, but the Lord especially descends to appease his unalloyed devotees. And he writes, Sri Krishna descends for the specific purpose of mitigating the anxieties of the pure devotees. So it's really that's what calls him is it's it's love that calls him, and he responds to your love with um, incredible reciprocation and just to get in just to go a little bit deeper into this let's look at arjuna let's look at the difference between arjuna on one side who it appears krishna is taking his side and duryodhana on the other side who it appears krishna is not taking the side of. but really isn't it if we go back there was a point in history before that battlefield where you had arjuna and duryodhana and they both had the choice do they want to choose krishna or do they want to choose Krishna's armies? Do they want Krishna himself, or do they want Krishna's facilities, right? And so this was before the battle, both Arjuna and Duryodhana went to see Krishna. And, um, and Krishna was asleep at the time. They both had the request that they wanted Krishna to be on their side in the battle. And um, Arjuna was sitting at the feet of the bed, the foot of the bed, and Duryodhana was sitting like closer to Krishna's head. And when Krishna woke up, the first person that he saw was Arjuna, and the second person that he saw was Duryodhana. And so Duryodhana said, I was here first. I should, I should get to make my request first. And Krishna said, well, you may have been here first, but I saw Arjuna first. So, you know, I'm going to allow him to, to ask first. And he says, Arjuna, I know why you've come here. And... Um, I'm going to just tell you straight out, I'm not going to fight in this battle. I'm not going to take up weapons and participate myself. But I offer you the option, do you want me and I won't be fighting? Or do you want my armies? And you could take my armies and they will fight. And Arjuna's response was, all I want is you. You know, th th this is my, I'm not interested in exploiting your, your, your faculties. I simply want to always be connected intimately with you. I, I want you. And Duryodhana was like, okay, great, because <laughs> if you're not going to fight, then what's the point? I'll take your armies. And they so Krishna was equal to both of them, but he, um, but but it was, but they each approached him with a different mood, and it was Arjuna that approached him with love, and so the reciprocation is different. And then he sa it's said that he comes to um, deliver the sadhus. Now look how. Krishna delivered Arjuna. He delivered him on that battlefield. He drove his chariot. He personally instructed him and cared for him on that chariot through 18 days of battle and, and, and you know, saved him in many ways. And when we read, there's a beautiful chapter, really incredible chapter, the 15th chapter of the first canto of the Bhagavatam, which is called the Pandavas Retire Timely, where Arjuna is speaking with Yudhishthira. And he's looking very dejected. And there's all these inauspicious omens. And Yudhishthira is asking, um, in the previous chapter, Yudhishthira is asking Arjuna, what's wrong? Could it be this? Could it be that? And then in this chapter, um, Arjuna begins to answer. And he goes on a long list of all the different ways 
that Krishna had entered their life and had saved them and cared for them and showed, showed his own personal love and sacrifice for him and his brothers. It, it's a beautiful, it's kind of like a, you get a you get a good overview of the Mahabharata and all the special the, this how special their relationship was, and after saying all this, this is what Arjuna says. Like in other words, Krishna by displaying and 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 uh, Todd asked, he said, was this, is this actually just one of his leelas? Is was it a game that he was enjoying? It is one of his leelas, and it was all of these pastimes that he performed with Arjuna were winning Arjuna's heart in a very beautiful and powerful way. And when we read them, they can win our heart too. They can. They can melt our heart. And so after th this conversation takes place after Krishna had passed away, Krishna had left the earth, and Arjuna is feeling deep feelings of separation for him, and but it's mixed with very deep love that he has for Krishna and appreciation for all that Krishna gave him. So in this way he delivered Arjuna, by winning his heart, because Arjuna opened his heart up to him, whereas Duryodhana didn't. And so th these are some of the verses that, Ar Arjuna says, after he gives this long list of all the incredible things that Krishna had done for him as a friend, he says, now I am attracted, this is a beautiful verse because it speaks to how important the Bhagavad Gita is. He says, now, after, now that Krishna has left, I am attracted to those instructions imparted to me um, by Krishna on the battlefield, the, the Bhagavad Gita, because they are impregnated with instructions for relieving the burning heart in all circumstances of time and space. And then Sutta Goswami says, thus being deeply absorbed in thinking of the instructions of the Lord, which were imparted in great intimacy and friendship, and in thinking of his lotus feet, Arjuna's mind became pacified and free from all material contamination. Arjuna's constant remembrance of the lotus feet of the Lord Sri Krishna rapidly increased his devotion, and as a result, all the trash in his thoughts subsided. Because of the Lord's pastimes and activities, and because of his absence, it appeared that Arjuna forgot the instructions left by the personality of God because he was in distress. And, you know. But factually, this was not the case. And again, he became the Lord of his senses. Because of his possessing spiritual assets, the doubts of duality were completely cut off. Thus, he was freed from the three modes of material nature and placed in transcendence. There was no longer any chance of his becoming entangled in birth and death, for he was freed from material form. So, you know, um, Parichranaya Sadhunam, Krishna comes to deliver the devotees, and he displays pastimes. There's pastimes of love for his devotees, and his response to those that don't approach him, or those that oppose his devotees, is always out of love for his devotees, strong and powerful. And although it appears like um, they're being condemned, which in one sense they are, Ultimately, because everything that he does is, is benedictory, they're ultimately benedicted. But there's a special benediction for us when we open up our heart to Krishna with love. So he's partial and he's not partial, right? It's the, the opportunity to be dear and reconnect with Krishna is open to everyone. There's absolutely no one that does not have access to that for any reason. But then according to how we approach him, he reciprocates accordingly. Mm. All right. That's beautiful. Thank you, Rogan. <clears throat> we got one more question. You're beautiful. How are you too? By Rogan? the way, I'm, I'm excited. You know, me and Kastuba had a little meeting yesterday, Mara. Where the heck is Mara? We had a little Where's meeting. You know, we're going to, while we're in Colombia, Kostuba's, oh, there, there you go. Hi, Mara. Just wanted to share this with you. Uh, you know, Kostuba's going to go through a first canto chapter two. Mm. That's what his little mission is systematically taking people through the second chapter of the first canto, which is a great chapter. And I am going to systematically take people through the 10th canto as much mm. as we can get in there. Um, the 10th canto is huge, but um, it's all those incredible uh, Krishna leelas. So we're going to get a lot of sweet baby Krishna in Colombia, as well as the 10th canto, as well as exotic adventures. And fruits. And, and fruits, of course. Yeah, yeah that's incredible part of fruits. The exotic there. adventure. Yeah. Colombian oh, fruits you've never heard of, Mara. Yeah. yeah now, right. um, you know, uh, I was going to say, we didn't mention tomorrow we have an interview, incredible interview, right, with Simon Haas. Yeah. We're this excited is, for Simon Haas. He grew up yeah. a devotee of Krishna, right? Yes, he did. He's a prolific author, a respected prolific author. He wrote a book on, what's it called, uh, Dharma? The book that we're going to talk about is called The Book of Dharma. 
the book of Dharma. People love um, it. He, he wrote another great book um, called Yoga and the Dark Night of the Soul. Yoga and the Dark Night of the Soul. Okay. And uh, just a really wonderful person. He's a scholar. A really, I really respect his scholarship um, as well as um, just his personality. He's a real devotee, a real Vaishnava, you know, a gentleman. He's a good guy. So we'll, we'll going to do that interview. I, I'm going to take a day off. You can take the day off. Or you I'm going to pull rest. back a little. I'm going to listen. I'm just going to listen. But I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear Simon Haas. But I just feel like I've been going. And you know, Kostuba, sometimes you yeah. got to be a little gentle with yourself. You do. I just want you to you, hear you that. You do, Raghunath. Sometimes you just got to slow that. down. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that message with me. You know, every, every time I mention a verse, I get a little Karuna over here saying, I know the Purchure Naya verse. <laughs> she knows everything. She know, Mara, she knows all these verses. Can you believe that? You know what? I know. I'm gonna, She's I'm so far ahead of me. <laughs> Mara, um, I'm gonna. You, you're going to Na You're going to uh, Nashville. You're going to uh, Columbia. I'm giving you Shloka Mission. Oh. A Shloka mi Matter of fact, anybody who's going to Columbia has gone a Shloka Mission with you, Mara, and they're gonna they're gonna <laughs> learn these verses. You're not gonna be able to leave or get out. You know how they have these vaccine passports? You're gonna need a Shloka passport. To get the hell out of Colombia. <laughs> Unless you have that Shloka passport, you are not leaving Colombia. Okay? Or you're you not going everybody there. Everybody Shlokas they have to learn. And they're the basics. They're not even tricky ones. They're basics. These are things that have to be part. Just like you say something like, she sells, she sells by the seashore. Everybody just going to say that. We need that in our brain. It's your stuff kids learn when they grow up in India. It lodges in their brain as little nugget little nectar nuggets that are stored in the brain and it's it's over mara your days of just walking around there whipping things chopping th it's over add transcendental wisdom to the skull <laughs> okay okay it's like yes prabhu and all you alls too <laughs> all right what else we got we got one more question today and this is coming from a daily zoomer cherry charity cherry yannick from New York City. Oh, Sherry from Brooklyn. Yannick. Yeah. All right, what do we got? She writes, uh, she writes, is it okay to chant the, the Maha Mantra in your head during boring meetings? <laughs> That's probably the best thing you can do. <laughs> At my job as a school librarian, I'm required to attend an overwhelming amount of irrelevant meetings where I'm not expected to contribute, but my body is required to be there. Oh, is man. it bad I to hate chant meetings? <laughs> is it bad? When Kostuba calls me for about a meeting, I was like, oh, please, no, Kostuba, please. Please, no meeting. <laughs> yeah, th th those are meetings where someone's trying to help you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> someone's trying to serve you <laughs> in ways that you de de desperately need. Okay. She says, um, is it bad to chant in my head during these meetings? I used to get so annoyed at having to attend so many meetings but feel a greater sense of calm when I'm chanting. I remember Kostuba saying that he chants on crowded subways. Is this okay too? I know the ideal setting for chanting is not in a meeting, but is it okay to add some chants here? Is it okay to add some yeah. chants, Rogo? In a crowded subway, you're not supposed to be listening to what they're talking about. Though. <laughs> That's Kostuba <laughs> just taking up time. But that being said, there are meetings where it almost feels like do you need me or a cutout cardboard picture of me? And I will say that <laughs> right. if I was a little bit more God conscious, perhaps I'd be sattvic and listen and say, you know, perhaps I can derive some good information out of this meeting and apply it to my life for the betterment of society. But generally, there's a tiny bear in my mind banging big symbols together during meetings like this. Um, now, since I've gotten into bhakti, that bear has been replaced by a little devotee banging cartels or wampers together during meetings. <laughs> Is that a monkey? And that it's not a monkey; it's a devotee banging cartels <laughs> okay. together in my mind. So, you know, Mara, if you ever want to have a meeting with me, Kastuba, you should understand. There's a little devotee, and I'll be nodding and I'll be smiling. But I will also, there will be a little man banging cartels we, together. We know, we know that your Maha head is Mantra. completely somewhere else, Raghunath. We, we're quite aware of that. You're quite aware. <laughs> we, but, but we picture it as a monkey banging symbols. It's, it's in not a head. monkey. It's a little shaven head, chubby little Brahmin boy. Okay. <laughs> sort of like, 
<laughs> like uh, Choti Walla in Rishikesh. Mm. Uh, that's it. So yeah, chant that Hare Krishna Maha Mantra or be incredibly conscious or do a happy combination of both, Sherry. It's always good to chant. And that was taught by, you know who taught that? Who, who, who uh, gave Lord the example? Chaitanya? Well, it was, Lord but in a, in a com who taught it to Lord Chaitanya? God? It was it, I think his name was, I, I, I slipped on my mind right now, but I think it was like Gora. I don't, I don't it's not Gora Govinda, but it was like this little boy. What was his name again? Guru, oh, yeah. Gora, Guru, Gorga Goswami. Uh, Gu, 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 Guru Gopal. Guru Gopal, Gopal, Guru. Gopal Guru. Gopal Guru. Gopal Guru. That's it. Gopal Guru. Do you know the story? Um, he was the, he was the son of Parmananda Puri, I think. Parmananda Puri was a sannyasi. You sure? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <Just> talking. <laughs> but but um but he, it had I, I'm forgetting the story, but it's just this is just reminding of it. But I think Lord Chaitanya was he just couldn't stop chanting. Even when, even when he was going to the bathroom and he was saying like, well, you know, when you chant the holy name, that's Krishna himself. And I don't want to bring him into like the latrine, you know, but he couldn't stop chanting. He was like trying to hold his tongue, but he just couldn't stop chanting. That's the big question. Can we chant in the bathroom? Yeah. And you well, have so an then, answer for us here. So Gopal Guru said, oh, yes, we should always chant even at the time of death. Which is he he which I guess in that culture is considered to be like an impure time when the body is just you know falling apart in so many ways whatever but he said especially at the time of death we're meant to chant so why not when you're going to the bathroom you should chant all the time and uh, and Lord Chaitanya said that's where he gave him the name okay your name is Gop his name was Gopal he said now your name is Gopal Guru mm -hmm. right? because now you gave me very good instruction he was a disciple of Rakeshwar Pandit says Balaram Perez the info is coming in now. And his father was, his father's name was Morari Pundit. Thank you, Balaram. Balaram, I want to reach out to you. We got stuff we got to talk about. We're going. We're going to see Balaram. We're going to England. Me and Kastu, we're going to England. Oh, so is that this? You're going. You got your dates. I'm going. Okay, I'm good. going. I'm still good. taking it gentle, but that's not until December. <laughs> okay, let you should you should let them know over there because they're still wondering. I spoke with them yesterday over there. So did, they say they're hearing from other people that you're going there, but they hadn't heard from you yet. So I'm coming to England. All right, so uh, we will have a good time when we're there. I think that's it. We'll brother. have I think a that's good it time then. Cherry, I, ho I hope that helps. No, we'll have right. a good time Cher then. You know, Sherry, the cats so Sisky. in the cradle and the silver spoon. Me and uh, Coastal okay. Stuba and the man on the moon. <laughs> Just we got to do something about it. <laughs> your Harry Chapin cover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what can I do? It's been programmed in my brain. <laughs> But Sherry Sobozinski saying she's a librarian too, and apparently these librarians have. I didn't think they would have any meetings. I thought they just sit there, but they have like lots of meetings apparently. Are you kidding? Sherry's meeting all day, but there's a problem. Yeah. She's very Krishna conscious, and uh, she's got everyone's like, like, "What is she talking about all the time?" <laughs> what can she do? She's been possessed by spirits. It's affected us all. Thanks everybody for joining us, and we hope to see you in Kali, Colombia. Which means you got to go to, what is it again? I keep forgetting. Bhakti Retreats 108 at gmail.com. That's where you're so right. You're going to join us there. We're going to sing. We're going to dance. We're going to eat pakoras. We're going to have a wonderful old time. We'll hold hands, dance in circles, sing holy names, bring puppies. They you have see that various. puppy dancing over there with Carlos. Yeah, Carlos has a puppy. You can bring his puppy. Oh, speaking of dancing puppies, here's Bunky in the background. And then, of course, me and Bobby Marchand, we're doing our uh, Bhakti Yin and Restorative. Now's the time to restore your Bhakti life and do some Yin Yoga. If you're a teacher, you want to upgrade your teaching. Or if you just want to, like, learn how to chill out well, check out that training that we're doing there. You get a discount if you do any of the two trainings. And, of course, Kirtan Academy with me and Madhu. We love that. And we are hanging out in... Sham Ashram for a month. I'm looking forward to it. I can't even believe it's happening. And I get to hang out with the stupid Mara. And it's my birthday. It starts on my birthday. Oh, you know your birthday. 56 yeah. years dead. 56 years old. It's only a matter of time now. It's countdown before. Yeah, uh, let's see the, the, the dance cam hero. Come on. Let's see this puppy. Where's the puppy? Oh, it's Carlos's beautiful new puppy. It's young, young Carlos and his young dog. 
Oh, Alex Bjorn. Yeah, there it is. Look at that little. Is oh that a beagle? God. What is that? Yeah, it's, it's a beagle. beagle. 